Order. And it is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. And we will start with listed questions. And I call Mrs. Karen McEvitt. Ms. McEvitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one. Our proposals, proposals for the Rural Development Programme 2014 to 20, are designed to help meet my department's vision for a thriving and sustainable rural economy, community, and environment to promote social and economic equality. The programme will continue strongly to help the agri-food industry prepare uh, future market opportunities and economic challenges to improve the lives of farmers and other rural dwellers targeting resources where they are most needed, and to help deliver improved sustainable environmental outcomes. I recently announced the publication of the Executive's response to Going for Growth, which outlines the actions the Executive Departments and agencies will take to address the recommendations made by the Agri-Food Strategy Board to grow our agri-food sector. One of the key actions for DARD is the delivery of a Farm Business Improvement Scheme as part of the next RDP. This scheme will comprise a range of measures aimed at knowledge transfer, innovation and capital investment. It will provide support for increased farm and production, sustainability and improving competitiveness through increased efficiency, more integrated supply chains and adapting to market requirements. The RDP also includes proposals for a range of schemes to support agricultural production methods that help with the protection and improvement of the environment and our countryside. Through the programme, we propose to support uh, the planting of new woodlands and the management of existing forests to help reduce the effects of climate change. The RDP will focus on developing and improving rural areas by promoting economic growth through the provision of support for rural businesses and rural tourism. We propose to support the renewal of rural villages linked to village and the community plans which will be developed by the new councils. And there will also be measures to improve the living conditions and the welfare of those that are living in rural areas. Mr. McEvitt, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for a uh, response to the question? But could I ask her, in her vision, um, to outline her plans to provide financial support uh, through the Rural Development Scheme or other EU um, funding schemes to support farmers in ASASIs? I said very clearly, we have set out the vision. What we want to create is sustainable rural communities going into the future, and that takes into account, obviously, anybody who lives in ASA um, also. I'll be meeting actually a group of farmers tomorrow who come from, from that background to discuss just the challenges that, that they have, so um, I'm keen to do that. But the core of Going for Growth, the core of the Rural Development Programme is about supporting all farmers right across the board and assisting them to be able to grow and support them with investment, whether that be capital investment through the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, around knowledge transfer, around innovation, around practical um, supports, around looking at their production and their efficiency. So there's quite a range of measures there that will be there um, to support all, uh, um, all farmers, no matter um, how difficult uh, conditions it is that they're farming. I call on Mr Sean Lynch. Good morning. I'll get the previous comment here. I'm going to go to the question. Can I ask the Minister to outline the timings in place for the scheme opening? Good morning. Well, the, the first important stage is that we receive EU um, approval for the programme and once we have clarity on the EU scheme rules we will be able to design the scheme documentation and the guidance in preparation for opening the schemes. As regards the delivery mechanisms, my officials have been looking at the timelines from the previous programme for establishing the local action groups and the Access One delivery agent and they are factoring these into the delivery plans for the next programme. The date for opening any schemes will then be dependent on the programme being signed off at European Commission level and on getting the necessary business case approval in place. But um, at this stage, it is fair to say that I am pretty confident that we will be um, hitting the ground running, that we have done a lot of preparatory work in terms of being in a state of readiness once we have that EU sign off. We will have initial um, correspondence from Europe in January and then we hope to have formal official sign off at European level um, in mid March, which would allow us then to um, have our strategies in place and um, get the programme opened in line with the, the new programme start date in um, April May. And I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. In light of the budget announcement this morning and further tightening of public spending, will the Minister now be upfront about the budget for a key rural development programme? The proposal, the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, and I know, Minister, you, you mentioned it um, to, in the previous question. Um, Will the Minister stand here today and give a guarantee that when requested by the Strategy Board, the Executive will be able to provide the £250 million? Pounds? Well, clearly the Executive is facing very difficult decisions, particularly in the context, and you probably know more about this, and your party will probably know more about the Tory government and how, how they carry out their business, but we're facing the climate that we are 
because of the onslaught year on year from the Tory government. So let's always put that in context in terms of the budgets that we here in this executive are, are dealing with and the tough decisions that we're going to have to take in the time ahead. The executive has very clearly put on record its support for the agri food industry. It's very clearly put on record its support for the schemes that we have outlined through the Going for Growth um, piece of work. So I will be looking to the executive to honour those commitments and I have no reason to doubt that that would be the case. Are there going to be challenges in terms of each element of the programme? Absolutely. And I think that um, you know, I don't have a problem in, in, in saying that today. We may need to look at how we um, introduce the implementation of various elements of it. As I said, it's quite a far reaching programme. There's quite a lot of elements to it. So being mindful of all the challenges that my department, alongside other departments, are going to have to take uh, or address in the time ahead, for me, what's most important is that I take a fair, a balanced approach in finding any necessary savings that have to be found, and that will be done in consultation with the industry. Thank you. And Mr. Alec Maskey is not in his place, so I move on to Mr. Declan McAleer. Uh, question, number three. question number three. The programme is making a real difference to the lives of many rural dwellers by addressing, through a suite of schemes, issues of poverty, social isolation and disadvantage in rural areas across the north, as identified in the Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Framework. I am delighted with the very significant outcomes that have been achieved through the delivery of the framework to date, which is on course to meet its £13 million programme for government target by 31 March 2015. Schemes being delivered include youth employability and entrepreneurship programmes, the Maximising Access in Rural Areas project, Fuel Poverty Energy Efficiency Work, the Assisted Rural Travel Scheme, the Rural Challenge Programme, the Connecting Elderly Rural Isolated Project, the Farm Family Health Checks Programme, the Rural Borewell Scheme, support for the Rural Support Charity and support for rural community development work. Many of these initiatives are excellent examples of benefits from successful partnership work and across government and with the statutory sector. I am particularly pleased with the increased access to services in rural areas which has been achieved through the delivery of these initiatives and I remain committed to tackling the key challenges facing those living in rural communities in the time ahead. And Mr. Declan McAleer for... Um, uh, uh, could the Minister tell us what actions are being delivered for uh, young people in rural areas in relation to anti-poverty and social inclusion? Yes, um, through the, the Tripsy framework, the Tackling Poverty and um, Isolation framework, my department has been supporting two key uh, main Ruth, or rural youth initiatives aimed at increasing employability and promoting entrepreneurship among vulnerable young people in rural areas. Through the Youth Employability Programme, marketed as a boost, unemployed rural young people have an opportunity to develop skills to increase their employability and to improve their chances of securing a job. The programme is currently the only employability programme in the north, specifically targeted to 16 to 24 year olds living in rural areas. BOOST, which also um, is supported by the Department of Employment and Learning, offers a tailored package of intensive support, including face to face workshops, CV clinics, an interactive support package, access to a network of employment mentors, and the provision of industry endorsed certification from the Federation of Small Businesses on completion. The programme is targeting almost 1,500 unemployed young people in the age group of 16 to 24 and by the 31st of March 2015 with more than 1,000 young people having received the completion certificates to, to date. The department is also supporting the Rural Youth Entrepreneurship Programme which has recently been extended in the north following the evaluation of an initial 28 month pilot which was delivered throughout international partnership in Finland, the Faroe Islands and Greenland as well as two local partners, the Rural Development Council and Advantage Foundation Limited from Carrick Fergus. The Rural Youth um, Entrepreneurship Programme remains an awareness raising and animation programme designed to stimulate 16 to 30 year olds in disadvantaged rural areas, predominantly rural dwellers within the top 50% multiple deprivation measures, or to consider self-employment and entrepreneurship as a viable career path for young people whilst allowing them to stay in their rural community. The programme also creates the foundations for the development of future rural businesses through a series of interactive workshops, networking events, masterclasses, study visits, seminars and mentoring sessions. Over 500 disadvantaged um, rural young people participated in the initial pilot with 100 completing business action plans and progressing their, um, to further business development support through the programme's inbuilt referral process. So um, quite a work is on, um, ongoing in terms of um, tackling rural um, unemployment. Yeah, I know it's a detailed answer, but if we could just work to the two minutes round, I'll call Mr Gregory Campbell. Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister will be aware that there are considerable numbers of uh, severely disadvantaged people uh, in rural areas. She's had an opportunity to look at the draft uh, budget 
How does she affect? Uh, how does she believe the draft budget will affect the framework as she has outlined it to date? Well, this area of work, the whole area of tackling poverty and isolation, remains my priority. It's a policy priority for me, so that also will obviously be factored into any future budget decisions that are taken. Um, that being said, I'm committed to making sure that this is a draft budget, that we go out to consultation, that we talk to stakeholders, the rural stakeholders, the farming community, those people that live and work in rural communities, and then any decisions that are taken will be taken in that context in the round. As I said earlier, it, um, and particularly in terms of the draft budget, DARD itself had a long-standing weakness in the budget and that we traditionally relied on um, in your monitoring to be able to secure additional funding. So I was delighted to be able to receive an allocation of funding through this budget process. However, we are in draft process. I do intend that I'll be back to the executive for further discussions as part of that process on the back of the discussions that I'll have with stakeholders. Councillor Pat Ramsey. Principal Deputy Speaker, further to the original question, could I ask the Minister, is she content with the level of collaborative work with other departments looking at and setting action plans to look at the most vulnerable disabled people within our rural communities? I'm content that um, I think the work that we've done under the Tripsy project has been an excellent piece of work and the staff stand up for themselves. Some of the programmes as they come towards uh, the end of, of particularly those that are pilots where we're still evaluating the outcome. I think the outcomes are particularly for quite a number of the programmes are, are clear to be seen. The fact that even if you take young people, that we have so many young people get involved in the employability programmes, the fact that um, so many people, if you even measure in terms of the, the MARA project, the Maximising Access to Benefits project, the number of people that it's <coughs> helped, particularly around access to disability benefits and, and, and other, other benefits. So um, for me, the, the, this programme absolutely stands stands up in terms of merit and taking it forward. It also has, in a way, leveraged other departments to do things which they may not have done if this um, pot of funding wasn't here. So I very much look at it as leverage funding. Um, whilst the programme itself was 13 million, I think that um, the actual overarching value of it was, was way beyond that. And I don't have that figure with me, but it is quite significant investment in rural areas. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. To speak. I thank the Minister for her answer. But in her original answer, she mentioned fuel poverty. And given that the Department of Social Development um, has a relative failure there, what is her department specifically doing to help those in the rural areas with fuel poverty? As I said, it, it is taken forward as part of the Tackle on Poverty, the TRIPSI um, budget, on, on trying to alleviate and work with what are the other departments in terms of, of what we um, have done. In terms of, of what we have taken forward, the department, as you said rightly, DSD has primary responsibility in terms of tackling fuel poverty. Um, and my department is represented in what's known as the Interdepartmental Working Group on Fuel Poverty, which was established by DSD to ensure, uh, ensure sort of effective coordination of policies and actions across, um, across departments. And the Warm Home Scheme has been DSD and, and government's, I suppose, primary tool. And as you say, there's a, um, whilst there has been um, benefits to that, there's also um, challenges and things that could always be done better. In terms of my, my department and looking forward, we have, as I said, supported DSD through the extension of the Warm Home Scheme, particularly around those homes that are very hard to hit, old cavity walls, um, particular challenges that the, the grant that was there from DSD wouldn't cover for, for some of those older homes. So that has been my focus. I think that has um, been successful. Uh, but in looking, we're coming to the end of this programme, so we're looking forward and looking to new programmes, we need to look at new proactive ways to actually help those in rural communities who have additional challenges, merely maybe because, in, in this instance, because of the, the type of walls that they have in their homes, hard to heat homes. So um, I'm committed to making sure I do that. As I said, this area of work is a pre policy priority for me. You, and I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Question number four, please. My department is planning to deliver culvert upgrading works in the East Antrim area, costing over 150,000 over the next 12 months. In addition, Rivers Agency will continue to carry out maintenance and designated water courses to ensure that they are free flowing and performing their drainage function. Designated open water courses are routinely inspected and those benefit in rural areas typically on a six-year road inspection programme and water, um, urban water courses inspected and maintained annually. Where a designated water course is culverted, it is inspected on a three-year cycle. In addition, culvert inlet grills are inspected and maintained on a frequent basis, many of them weekly. Additional grill inspections are also undertaken when heavy rainfall is forecast and after flood events, as debris can often be carried downstream by high river flows causing obstructions. We are also drafting flood risk management plans for the North East River Basin District and these will set out a range of objectives and measures to reduce the risk of flooding from all significant sources.
Mr. Dixon for supplementary. <coughs> thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer thus far. Minister, uh, trusting that you uh, do subscribe to concerns about climate change, unlike others who do not seem to understand that climate change is a reality. What actions are you taking to uh, mitigate, mitigate against uh, the worst excesses of climate change and planning for the future to determine that not only in East Antrim but right across Northern Ireland that flooding can and will be alleviated in those areas which you have responsibility for? Well, Rivers Agency have been very proactive and particularly working with the Met Office and have just recently signed an agreement with Met Office. So that's around, um, I suppose, us forward planning in terms of the impact of, of climate change and other things, because the map systems that we have maybe um, could always be improved. So we're now, in terms of the maps, that we're in a better position, and that's a collective effort, and, and will hopefully improve things. I, Rivers Agency are obviously very focused on the fact that we have a different climate. We've seen extreme weather. If we look at even the snow in the March of, of almost two years ago, if you look at um, the extreme flooding that we, we, we uh, that occurs within an hour's notice, so there, this is obviously factored into Rivers Agency work programme and the work that they do in terms of maintenance and as part of their actually um, part of their business plan. And I call Mr. Ian Mallow. Flood alleviation projects. Good. Each, each um, area is considered on its own merit. Funding for, for projects right across the north are prioritised on the basis of the, the level of risk that is um, posed to people and to property, and then the associated costs and the benefits um, to the project to alleviate funding. Um, obviously, just given uh, the economic climate, you are always trying to look at where we can get the best value for the investment. Rivers Agency um, take that forward in a very um, constructive and structured way, um, but it's basically it, it boils down to um, prioritising the basis of the level of risk to property and then the associated costs and the benefits that could be derived from that investment. And I call Mr. Alistair Macdonald. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, th could I thank the Minister for her answers, particularly regarding flooding in East Antrim, but could I ask her what initiatives are being taken to deal with various water courses in South Belfast? that lead to persistent flooding in Finnehy, Lisburn Road and generally across South Belfast? Uh, the member will be aware, and I think I have um, talked to him about this before and during question time, where the, the cross-departmental um, working group that is in place that is looking at South Belfast, and my department is playing a key role in terms of its role and what it needs to be doing. I have actually visited South Belfast. I have met with residents. We have discussed the, the problems that we have. There were um, additional members of staff employed there in the past to deal with the issues, and also um, we increased the inspection on the grills because there was some problem with debris, etc. So hopefully that gives the member assurance that Rivers Agency are playing their role in terms of tackling the problems that those people in South Belfast have. Thank you. And I call Mr Roy Beggs. Number five. With your permission, Lesh Kankorli, I'm going to answer questions five and nine together. On the 26th of June, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister conveyed agreement to relocation of my departmental headquarters to Ballykelly. The project is now proceeding and involves a new build to accommodate 400 workstations to be completed by the end of 2017 and an extension to accommodate a further 200 workstations to be completed by the end of 2020. My officials are continuing to liaise with OFM, DFM, DFP and other government departments and agencies about the design, the planning, construction and access arrangements. The current programme plan indicates that the tender for the construction phase will be awarded at the end of 2015. The relocation of my department to Ballykelly will stimulate both rural development and local economy through increased local spending, provision of high quality and high value public sector jobs and potentially associated with the construction and the ongoing servicing of the new accommodation. This will be a welcome boost to the construction industry and it will help to share wealth across the economy and distribute to um, or contribute to better balanced economic growth and help to address disparities in the distribution of public sector jobs across the north. And I'll call Mr. Roy Beggs. The Minister, uh, along with the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, uh, appears indifferent about the possible poor use of our limited public funds. Can the Minister advise why it has not been published that there is a full cost benefit analysis in order to ensure good practice? And will she ensure? that uh, money is spent in the most efficient way and we minimise the amount of money it has to be spent on buildings and future travel costs uh, and would you accept that uh, in getting there 
that there should be agreement with the Department of Finance and Personnel and indeed has her accounting officer agreed with this proposal? Well, if I work in reverse, yes, my accountant officer is working um, to my uh, direction. Um, the, DF, the executive has agreed on the movement uh, of DARD to Ballykelly. I'm committed to taking that project forward. We have a programme board in place. Um, it's full speed ahead. Work is ongoing. We're working very closely with staff in terms of staff planning and moving forward. We have a business case. It's, it's cleared all of DARD's internal assurance processes. Executive approval was given on the 26th of June. I can say no more. It's clear as that. Thank you. And I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, would the Minister consider working with local businesses and community voluntary groups, such as the Shackleton and Aviation Museum, on the Bally Kelly site to maximise the use and encourage both local people and the local economy? I mean, I absolutely agree with that. And DFP actually, as the owners of the site, or the executive as the owners of the site, are keen to explore that. And, and once we've made it, once we made the decision. It was very evident that there's a lot more people who have interest in that site. So I think that there's um, massive potential benefits for the North West, not just for all these public sector jobs coming, but also everything else that will flow for it. So um, I'm absolutely happy to, for, uh, in terms of the planning and moving forward, that we work with the local community because the benefits for, for the local community are, are clear to be seen, particularly around the construction, particularly around the footfall, the increased footfall for the area. So I'm very happy for that to be the case. I call Mr. George Robinson. <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, would the Minister agree that the potential jobs boost and eco economic stimu stimulus by the use of the entire site at Ballykelly, including her department's headquarters, which my MLA colleague Gregory Campbell and I strongly lobbied for, will be a vital aspect of the economic recovery for the North West of Northern Ireland and even further afield? I absolutely agree with the, the knock-on impact. At the core of this, I think, is the fact that we're going to have a fair distribution of public sector jobs. It's a, ban it's a boost to the North West in terms of those um, jobs coming there. It's a boost to the local construction industry. It's a boost in terms of Ballycaddy itself and the increased footfall. So I, I think that the potential on that site is fantastic and it, it is going to be a, a really good news story, um, which I think will trickle down over years to come because obviously I think when Dard moves, then the other things will, will follow. So it is absolutely a good news story for the North West. Call Mr. John uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, can I ask the Minister, given that this is a major element in the redevelopment of the Shackleton site, has she had any discussions with the Minister for Regional Development in uh, terms of uh, establishing a railway point uh, for clearly so many people that would be of enormous benefit? Yes, I have in the past met with the DRD Minister. We've had discussions. Um, I think it's a, it's a great idea. I think that it's not without its problem or its challenges, but that's um, something that's being explored, or explored by the DRD Minister and his officials. So we look forward to maybe some positive outcomes of that. I, I think it was very evident from the first discussions that we had that um, there were a number of challenges just with timings in the North West, but um, hopefully it, it's, well, it is still in consideration and, and maybe we'll have something positive from that. I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Uh, Minister, I'm sure you, you would agree with me that uh, the benefits of relocation do far outstrip the negativity of some of the arguments put against the planned relocation of the, the, the headquarters. Yes, I mean, as I said, the economic benefits are, are clear to be seen. The, the stimulus in terms of jobs, the ongoing service of the building, the construction of the building, the knock-on impact on the local economy, the follow-through with other businesses coming to that site. Um, it's all going to be to the tremendous benefit of the North West. This, for me, is about a fair distribution of public sector jobs, and it's about stimulating that local economy. It's also about bringing Dard closer to its rural routes. So, for me, the opportunity that we have for, for the first department to move Lock, Stock and Barrel into um, the North West is, is something that, that, that is to be welcomed and something that maybe other ministers will consi con consider in terms of any moves in the future, then making sure that they do create employment in rural areas and opportunities for, for those in the public service. And I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, given the costs, the level of objection from Belfast staff to this significant relocation, is this really a proposal with which the Minister should persist? And can she give us our reassurances that it's not going to cause utter chaos in terms of the delivery of the functions of her department? 
I think it, the, the, the views of staff, and I've outlined this before, but it was taken forward in a, in a number of phases, but particularly the views of staff within Dundonald House, within headquarters staff, given that it's been there for 50 years, it's predominantly made up of staff who live in the Greater Belfast area. So it's only natural when it comes to change, those people may not want to move. But that's why we've had a long lead-in time, that's why we're phasing it in. So we allow for those staff changes to happen. And that's only being done, that's being done in full consultation with the unions, with staff side representatives. That's the only way we're going to be successful. This is a wider project even than DARD in terms of um, staff and public service moving. This is about new ways of working. This is about working right across all departments because whenever we went out to the wider, um, after the initial survey with just DARD staff, when you go out to the wider um, uh, departmental staff and then again to the wider civil service, there's more than enough people who want to pursue opportunities closer to, to home to give them a better work-life balance. And it's only right that they should also have the opportunity to be able to achieve um, uh, promotion is not have to come to the Greater Belfast area to be able to get that. So um, I am confident that we are able to manage the staff issues in full consultation with them, with our union representatives in moving forward and I think this, the phased um, process which we have stepped out fairly clearly allows us to be able to do that. And I call Mr Duffy Mackay. Okay, Stephen Shea, question number six. The Farm Business Improvement Scheme, which includes a portfolio of measures to support sustainable growth in the farming sector, is currently under development as part of the wider Rural Development Programme 2014-20. On the 14th of October, I announced the submission of the draft programme to the European Commission. Formal approval and Commission decision will depend on the nature and extent of the comments on our draft programme. My officials are working to obtain an EU Commission decision by April 2015. In, in conjunction with seeking EU approval on the overall funding package, my officials will continue to work with um, to develop the detail of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme and the associated business cases. The date for opening any calls under the Farm Business Improvement Scheme will depend on the programme being signed off by the European Commission and on getting the necessary business case approval for funding in place. In rolling out the Farm Business Improvement Scheme, the early focus will be on making advice and support available to farmers to help them clearly identify their needs and to make the right decisions about developing their businesses. Officials are also considering how best to communicate and publicise the Farm Business Improvement Scheme once it's ready to open. I call Mr. Dahi McKay for a supplement. Thank you very much. Can I can thank the Minister for that update. Uh, can I ask the Minister, under this scheme, what support there will be available for young farmers? Yes, subject to the necessary approvals, the proposed Farm Business Improvement Scheme is going to include a tiered capital grant support at up to 40% of eligible costs and initiatives to promote the sharing of knowledge, encourage innovation and improve the quality of the land. There is also the potential for additional grant aid of 10% um, under the capital investment um, scheme for those defined as young farmers, innovative projects and projects which help to improve the environment up to a maximum of 50 per cent, so we will be weighting um, more heavily towards young farmer in terms of that support going, um, in terms of the match for funding um, for, for those farmers going forward. So I know that is something that is um, obviously welcomed by the young farmers. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Can the Minister indicate if Dard or herself has had any discussions with the banks to make sure that there will be co-funded finance on the business farm business improvement scheme when they come forward? Um, I have regular engagement with banks, but as part of this programme, we are still working up the scheme. And once we have more detail of the scheme and the scheme detailed rules, then yes, as part of the rollout of that process, we would be wanting to um, engage with the banks. You'll have, the member will have noted last week we had um, another bank actually, um, actually launching a, a pot of money which is prioritising young farmers. So that is something to be welcomed. It shows maybe there is maybe more of a willingness on behalf of banks to, to, to loan to the farming community. They also talked about extending credit, but that is just one bank among others who have, who have um, obviously all different offers on. So maybe there is a change in tide in terms of willingness to lend, but as part of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme and what we roll out, then we will obviously be engaging with the bank sector and those people that may be involved in financing farmers. On order, that ends the, uh, the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr Paul Frew. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, given the fact that within one month uh, farmers and producers can expect to uh, receive their single farm payments, has the Minister uh, yet communicated with the producers and farming community of the areas that will be subject to remote sensing inspections this year? And can she tell this House today the four areas for which she has been selected? 
The, the member will be aware that given um, EU rules, there are certain things that we can and cannot do and can and cannot say at a certain time. At this moment in time, I have announced the targets. We are on, um, on target to pay 93 per cent of all claimants in December, which I am very much committed to. That also includes 500 remote sensing inspections, which is um, double the number from, from last year. So I hope to continue on the positive trend that, which we have um, developed over the last number of years. Remote sensing has worked um, very effectively this year and most associated field visits are, have been completed um, and there, or, or will be completed over the next number of weeks. But farmers cannot be told about the remote sensing at an earlier point in the year because of the potential of the control which Europe will obviously um, come down on us on. So the focus this year has been on reducing the time that we've, um, from when an inspection case reaches um, the, the, the department and to when it goes out to payment. So we're very much focused on making sure that we pay the majority of those people um, with, with, in December, as I said, 500, which is 250 more than last year. And you're right in saying that we have um, four areas identified this year, but again, we can't at this stage um, inform people. I took on board the commentary that we had last year in terms of where we were at, and we're intending to inform those people as soon as we possibly can within the confines of the European rules. I call Mr. Free for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer to my question. But does the Minister realise that in no other business world this could or be allowed to happen in the fact that there are people who are waiting for and relying on thousands of pounds in December and they do not know at this stage whether they will be able to get that money. And, and it, it, there's nothing positive with regards to coming out with a statement that you'll have so much percentage paid. Whenever in those four areas, they will be subject to so much pressure because it won't only affect the producer, it will affect the whole community with regards to the retailers and regards to the suppliers of those businesses. That it has, which is why we now have four control areas as opposed to two, which will hopefully lessen the impact which we saw last year. Um, my job is to protect the fact that we are paying out over £300 million in single farm payment every year. My job is to protect that and to show Europe that we are very cautious about the controls which they have dictated. So, but being proportionate about that, we're taking um, every step we can to inform the farmer as soon as possible within those rules that they will be receiving their money at whatever stage. But my principal aim is to make sure that we get to a stage where, one, we have everybody paid by December, and two, where we can actually be in a position where we have part payments. So that's what we're striving towards. We're clearly going in that uh, direction. The trajectory has been set out very clearly over the last number of years. There's been improvement year on year, and I'm committed to making sure that we drive forward. And that's all within the context of all the other changes that are going on in the department with cap reform and the new payment system and all of those things. But that, even with all of that, the department year on year has made improvements and will continue to do so. But I can make sure that every farmer, within the rules that are set down, I will make sure that every farmer who is impacted upon because of remote sensing is informed of that as soon as I possibly am able to. Thank you, Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, can you give this House an assessment of the likely effects that the cuts in the uh, draft budget will have and the impact that that will have on the uh, food and drink manufacturing sector? Well, as I said earlier, clearly the executive is facing um, very difficult decisions as a result of um, the year-on-year -year reductions to the Black Grant because of the Conservative Tory government um, cuts to public services. Because our um, Black Grant has not received an uplift year-on-year, we are facing real-time cuts. As I said earlier, DARD also said earlier, DARD has a, a long-standing weakness in its budget in that we had to bid in year in, in the monitoring round for part of our funding. So I welcome the fact that the executive um, allocated almost £20 million in funding to the department. However, alongside that, we have also um, been tasked, if, like other departments, and are subject to um, a cut, which is going to be a difficult situation to manage. At this stage, what I am um, very clear about is that we need full public consultation. This is a draft budget position. That um, I know I have policy priorities, but I want to consult very clearly with the industry, with um, stakeholders in terms of taking decisions and making sure that any outcome is balanced, that it's fair, and it's the best approach to finding the necessary savings. Um, then I go on. Yeah, sorry. 
It's a senior moment. I call Mr. Dixon. <laughs> thank you very much, President Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you, Minister. Minister, do you not recognise, and perhaps you could explain to the House, why uh, failed Sinn Féin public um, sector uh, financial policies have actually led to the impasse and will actually lead to uh, students not getting places in universities and colleges in, in order to deliver in the food and agricultural sector in Northern Ireland one of the key vital uh, aspects of life in this community contributing to our economy? I know the Alliance likes to sit on the fence, <laughs> but that's not the key. this is not what we can do here. There are difficult decisions to be taken, but you have to always put it in context. Why are we in this position? We are in this position because of the Tory cuts year on year to our block grant. And instead of bickering with each other in this chamber, people would be well served to work together to fight against the British Government on the cuts that are imposing on us. That's the approach that we should be taking. That's the approach that we should be taking. So there are difficult decisions that have to be taken in the time ahead. Let's never lose focus. It's because of the result of our block grant being cut year on year by the Tories. And then on top of that, on top of that, they also want to attack those on, um, on welfare. So this is not something that I believe that we can stand over. I don't think any elected politician should be able to stand over that. So I would ask you maybe to go away and think about what your party's position is in terms of sitting on the fence and letting the Tories impose these cuts year on year. Maybe that's where you should go. I call Mr. Order, order. I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Back to more mundane agricultural issues. Uh, the, the Minister or the Department had a bid in for £2.2 million for a, a new IT system. Does the Minister intend to put that in place? I think it was for the basic payment system that it was planned for. Does the Minister intend to put that in place this year or not, or what is the up-to-date situation? Well, yes, we have to put our new payment system in place because of the changes to cap reform, because of the, how the payment system will, our process is going to be different. So we have to take that forward. Um, we weren't successful in the bid. However, that doesn't mean that we, that we won't do it. It's going to have to now um, be found within the department budget because it's the necessary part of us being able to get payments out to farmers uh, on a timely basis. I call Mr. Elliott for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for the clarification. Given that we are now coming close to the start of the, the payment system for the single farm payments, will that impact? not having the, the new IT system in place now, will that impact on those farmers particularly who had inspections this year and delaying further uh, their payment uh, coming out of this SFP? To give the member assurance that the 93 per cent that we have set out as a target will be met, that will not be impacted because of this budget decision. That would, have, that would be more in terms of the changes post um, 2015. So in terms of this year, we are on target in terms of, of what I have set out and my aim is to pay the majority of people in December. Thank you. And call Mr. Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I've listened with interest to all of the issues that have went around here around single farm, farm payments. And I note, Minister, that you said 90% will approximately receive it by December. Um, is that figure feasible and achievable? as it has been an issue ongoing over a number of years where farmers haven't got their payments until, in some cases, June. And just to be clear, the target that I've set is 93 per cent. And in every previous year since I've taken up post, the situation has improved. Year on year, we've seen increases in the number of people that have been paid in December. As I said earlier in, a, in a question, an answer to a question, my aim is to have everybody paid in December. That's where we want to be. And secondary to that, we also want to be able to be in a position to do part payments. Part of getting us to that position has been remote control sensing and, make, and improving and increasing the number of people that we inspected this in that manner. So we are on target, uh, without, uh, notwithstanding all the difficult challenges that I have set out, we are on target to meet the 93 per cent in December. Mr Craig for supplementary. Thank you and I thank the Minister for that answer. But um, the 7 per cent that obviously will not meet the target, has the Minister any idea around time scales as to when they will get payments? or even part payments, as the Minister is trying to indicate here? The part payments won't be an issue this year. It would be in future years where we are talking about part payments. But in terms of 93 per cent in December, if we can do better than that, all well and good. And then the remainder will be paid as early as we possibly can throughout January, February and March of next year. I call Ms Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what progress has been made on the PEGI recommendations to move Rivers Agency to the Department for Regional Development and whether any work has been done to establish a flood alert and forecast service for Northern Ireland? 
In terms of the PEGI recommendations, I've always said that I'm very open to them, but they have to be in the context of the wider discussion around um, government departments and the roles that each government department have. So I, I'm not opposed to the idea, but it has to be considered in the round, and perhaps that's something that will be part of the discussions which we hope to be entering into over the next number of weeks as part of the talks process. And in terms of the, of the other piece of work, that work is actually ongoing. We've just recently signed an agreement with the Met Office, which is going to get things moving. So that's the first stage of taking that forward. Cochrane for supplementary. Thank you. Um, thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask what other measures um, she has taken to prepare for possible adverse weather conditions over the winter months? Yes, um, we're working and we're um, actually going to be going out to the press for the farming community over the next number of weeks just around a steady readiness in case that um, we find ourselves in situations of adverse weather. So we're giving out advice, we're um, signposting to CAFRI, our, our advice service, our advisory service. Our advisors are on, on the other end of the phone or in person to meet with the farming community just to talk about the challenges. But these are, I suppose, for any business uh, looking forward and looking towards the challenges, these, these are um, our, our attempt to try and assist the industry to be in a state of readiness. Thank you. And I call Mr Samuel Gardner. Deputy Speaker, will the Minister tell us how much farm income in Northern Ireland comes from the farm diversification projects? I don't have those figures on me, but I'm happy to provide it to, to the member in writing. Mr Gardner, for supplementary. Well, if she hasn't the figures with her, she'll not be able to answer me other parts, so I'll just wait on it coming. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mr Edwin Putz. I call Mr Edwin Putz. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister, uh, in relation uh, to the bovine um, issues around brucellosis, uh, what progress we're making in terms of having uh, the bovine, officially brucellosis-free status uh, in Northern Ireland once again? We've made great progress, and I'm pleased um, that, that we continue on that trajectory. The last confirmed case of brucellosis was on the 28th of February in 2012, and as a result, um, we have recently consulted on proposals to proportionally relax our pre-movement testing controls. So um, that's, that's a pre-movement um, testing saving to the industry of £7 million, which is something that obviously we've been working very hard to achieve. So we're hopeful that um, we, will be, we're, we are on target to obviously receive our free status in 2015. I call Mr Pitts for supplementary. And is it the intention to, to further relax uh, some of the standards that have been set with quite tight regulations? Um, over the course of the last number of years, uh, on the basis of getting officially Bruce's for, uh, or officially uh, Bruce Lucas free status. Yes, um, under the revised arrangements, um, the age of the animals to be pre-movement tested will increase from 12 to 24 months, and the validity of the test will be extended from 30 to 60 days for a single movement. And them changes come into effect on actually today, the 3rd of November. So, provided that there is no reversal in the trend, that we continue on, on the same direction that we are, um, we are, as I said, on target to be brucellosis free status for the North, which will obviously create that free status right across the island in March 2015. I call Ms. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. The Minister has recently produced the agricultural land use strategy. I wonder if she has had any discussions with other ministerial colleagues, particularly the Minister uh, for the Environment, in relation to an overall strategic land use strategy? I haven't had any recent discussions but with the Minister personally. However, at official level, um, they regularly engage in terms of taking forward um, the issues, and particularly where there's been a lot of work recently on the Nitrates Action Programme, which the member will be aware. So that's an ongoing piece of work, and it's a standing um, item of discussion at official level in terms of the environment, land use, um, Nitrates Action Programme, the Water Frameworks Directive, and all the other environmental um, issues which we, we as both departments share a common interest. Ms Lowe for supplementary. Uh, certainly, uh, I certainly think it is very useful for you know, all the different departments. What other departments do you think you know, should be involved in, in, in overall strategic land use strategy uh, discussions? I think the main um, partners for discussion are obviously DARD and DRD, but perhaps um, DRD, sorry, DARD and D <laughs> DRD, I think perhaps would probably benefit from a lot more discussion because this is in everybody's interest in terms of land use and protecting our future. So, um, very keen that uh, if that was to be widened out, that my officials and, and myself would play a role in terms of taking that forward. Order, time is up.